you say hallelujah. hallelujah. So let's do it. Yes. We all love Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. 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 Okay, now you, you have to start out by thinking back about five or six months ago when we heard there was going to be a mission trip to Africa. Okay, and this is what each one of us thought. Can you roll that video, Gloria? That was our first thought when we heard about it. Uh, but you know, our church has quite a connection with Sierra Leone through uh, Pastor Usman Forma. And it was impressed on us that we really should go. So we decided to. But I want you to remember everything for what we're talking about next. The three of us... We're the... We're the one, excuse me. I think he's trying to say we were the Lord's servants. We were the ones that went, but you guys are the ones that sent us. So you were a big part of this. And I have to make one more huge acknowledgement. Uh, yesterday afternoon, while I was putting the presentation together, I discovered that none of my video files would import into PowerPoint. Um, now that was a severe crisis. And I need to thank First world problems. Yeah, I, I need to thank Sheila. She spent she was up till three o'clock in the morning putting this together for me. So thank you, Sheila, for making this possible. Okay. Uh, let's see. I guess I got the clicker. Okay. So that shows you where Sierra Leone is in Africa, and that's about a thirty-hour trip from the time we left our house till we got our into our hotel. Now, this is meeting people at the airport that were part of our team. All right, I'm wandering through the airport, and I found two more people that looked very suspicious. These are characters. Let's start with the guy down here. Who are you? I'm Phil Keneally. You are? And what church are you from, Phil? Cedar Valley Community Church, Waterloo, Iowa. In Waterloo, Iowa? That's right, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And who's, who's this short guy that you're with? Well, I'm his parole officer. This is Daryl White. <laughs> Which is the pastor of the church in Iowa. Do we, do we need to check him for an ankle bracelet or what? <laughs> and what church are you from? Waterloo. Waterloo. Waterloo Church, yeah. Very good, so, very good. Pastor there. Okay. You guys looking forward to an exciting trip? Yep, absolutely. Get okay. Some warm weather, yeah. Some warm weather, cool. All righty. Okay, now I interviewed everybody before we left, but I'm not going to bore you with all those. Okay, so now we're gonna fast forward about 14 hours. Uh, we've been waiting in airports and we finally arrive in Brussels. <clears throat> okay, I have a question for you. Which first guy is who's gonna punch the dude with the camera? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay, oh, hi, I'm a pastor, nice to meet you. Hey, hey Daryl, what time is it in, uh, where are we? With Brussels. What time? It's, I don't know, what is it, about 8.30 or so? 8.50. So what time does your head say it is right now? 1.50 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> it's just early, early. Okay, another two-hour layover, another about eight or nine hours on the airplane, and we looked like this. <clears throat> now, we had before pictures. These are after pictures of 24 hours of travel. Xandra's the only one that looks happy. So we, we finally made it. We got one night rest in a nice hotel that was air conditioned. And this is what we looked like the next morning. We were actually ready to go and start our tour of Sierra Leone. So the first place we went was Hope. World Hope International to their headquarters and they told us about human trafficking and we all think of that in a sexual nature um, but it's not just that it is people who are enticed by the promise of jobs and put into slavery it is children captured and worked to death um, and there is the sexual slavery component of it so that was very difficult to hear the wonderful part of it, and the first thing that God to taught me was the power of human touch. 
World Hope International has a program called Enable the Children. Go look it up on the internet. But there is a grand total of four physical therapists for the entire country. They have trained about 60 physical therapy assistants. They started this program and we're servicing 60 children with severe disabilities. Um, a lot of them with cerebral palsy, Down's children, and these children are shunned. They are called devil children and snake people. So they start with um, contacting the uh, chief and see if they can come in and help these, this family. So there is our first little darling. She has cerebral palsy. She couldn't sit. Um, but with the work of the physical therapists, and there's her wonderful smile and the therapists working with her, she's now able to sit. Of course, it's not in a wheelchair. It's in a handmade wooden chair with Velcro to keep her limbs in a functional position. So we think about when pe we send people to therapy and they have roller balls to stretch limbs and no, in, in, yeah, wheelchairs and, and these, they have nothing. And it is all done by human touch and teaching the families how to do this. And there is the school children because the second person we went to see, we went to their school, their uncle met us at school and all the school children wanted their picture. And there they're getting therapy. All children love to have their picture taken over there and it was great with our phones because they could instantly see it and were so excited to see themselves. It's like seeing yourself on TV or something that would be here. While most of our crew, there were 10 of us, went on the physical therapy tours, it was also very interesting that there were two students from Indiana Wesleyan that were doing an internship over there physical therapy, and they were helping to teach new techniques to those, I'll say, physical therapists that are already working through World Hope. And this, and the gal that leads it is from England. She's a single woman, and she has dedicated her life to helping these children and try to get them the physical therapy they need. As Marcel says, they are shunned. But while the rest of the team was doing that, Tony and I had a driver that took us to see Usman. He is not the superintendent of the Wesleyan Church right now. He has moved on, someone new, They're, they have term limits, and he works for the government now. And so it, we had a grand tour of Freetown, which is the capital, and Two and a not, half million people. Yeah, and it's not anything like a big city here. Of course, a lot of the roads were dirt. A lot of the housing was just clay bricks that they have made. They have either thatched roof or tin roofs. That, and the tin roof is much more expensive and harder to get. When we were going through town, it was about lunchtime, and you saw students in uniforms everywhere. And we found out that they go to school in shifts, that there's a morning shift and an afternoon shift because they don't have enough facilities to be able to teach all their children. And when we got to the office where Usman works, which is a government building, and a lot of the buildings there are this way, that there is a wall around the compound. Our hotel was this way. There's barbed wire on top of the wall, and part of that is left over from the Civil War that we heard so much about, where so many of them lost their limbs. And it's to protect those inside. And the villages have none of that. They're just, you know, huts on one side of the road and huts on the other side of the road, and it's dusty and dirty. But after we did that, before we met back up, for, oh, I'm sorry, I've gotten away from myself. 
Um, we met Usman. His government building was nothing like I would consider ours. It was not air conditioned. Now his office was air conditioned, but we had to be greeted and we had to be taken to him. He was very excited to see us. He welcomed us very warmly. Um, he shared with his about his family. His wife has gone back to school and got her doctorate in midwifery and she is trying to teach through this medical school that is there how to be a midwife so that the infant mortality rate is very, very high and a part of it is due to childbirth and part of it is due for, to just common sense things that we think about that you know, just swabbing their nose out or swabbing their mouth out to get them to breathe. And uh, so she's doing a very good work. And Usman's oldest son is a senior at Indiana Wesleyan. And he is in the process. He hopes to go to medical school here so that he can go back and be a doctor in Sierra Leone which there are very few and far between. So we need to keep Usman and his family in our prayers that they can, they have a heart of gold to serve their own country and teach about Jesus. And at this point, it has to be through that physical touch and taking care of needs. Before dinner, which this is a picture of Marcel's dinner and she was very brave um, it's shrimp, and it's tiger shrimp. shrimp. Tiger shrimp, the eyes and everything. Uh, one of the gals from World Hope took us to a village market. And the village market was, you'd never know it was there. It was down this road that was a, a building, and it was hot, and there were just table after table that you would think of as booths, that they had trinkets for sale. There were all sorts of necklaces. There were all sorts of wooden figures that are up here. We'd love you to come look at them. Um, I thought it was very interesting. This giraffe I did purchase in Sierra Leone. This giraffe my daughter purchased when she was in Kenya. All of them in Sierra Leone looked like that. So they have different connotations of how the animals look. Um, they did a lot of things out of fabric that they did with candle wax and dyes that they made full pictures that were just incredible. So please come up and look. Uh, we also have samples of their money that this is a 10,000 Leone and it's only worth about a dollar and a quarter. So when we exchanged a $100 bill, we had a stack that was about like this. <laughs> and more like an inch. And the interesting yeah. thing is that is the largest denomination of a bill they have in the country. Yeah. <laughs> so you can imagine if you go to buy anything with cash of any value, real value, you know, you come up with a suitcase full of money. Yeah. Yeah, our, our carvings cost like 180,000 Leones. Which is, which is nothing. <laughs> which is less than $20. Yeah. Okay. And now Usman wanted to express his thanks to all of you because he, and we took a love offering to him and the big thing was he requested a laptop. So Tony did go purchase a laptop. He downloaded programs for him and he was very excited and wanted to thank us all for that. Good work, guys. So the other thing that we did around the same thing is we went to World Hope and they have a facility where, in, where disabled women um, make gifts. So my necklace, um, the bag up here, the cards, which are, are um, actually wood on paper, are all made by the disabled women. And they are sheltered there because, again, disabilities are are shunned you are part of the devil you are part, you are evil because you are disabled it is amazing how many of the things that all the good things that happen 
in Sierra Leone are done by what are called NGOs. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with that, that's a non-government organization, which means they're ministries and nonprofits that are trying to work to help people. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're gonna move into the fun part, and this is when we went to the villages. Now, in a minute, we're going to talk about the Mayintu village, which is the one that our Illinois district has been sponsoring. But the first village we went to was Makui, and this village was hoping that some of the individuals that were with us would sponsor their village. And so this was our greeting party in Makui. <laughs> Some of the interpretation in this is, is a welcome and a thank you to God for uniting us. Now when you enter a village, any of the rural villages, uh, there is a chief in the village. And you aren't allowed to talk to anyone or do anything in the village until you receive his permission. So the next video is when we were walking over to the chief's hut to see him. And Sin told you about the children and how they would just stare at us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the kids would want to come up and hold your hand. By the way, Daryl is 6'5". Who's your friend, Daryl? What? Who's your friend? I don't know. And after we walked up, we met the chief. He greeted us, and he was ill, so he was not able to be with us all day. And we did pray for him that he would be healed. Yeah. And like a lot of people, it's a very unusual culture there. Depending on where the money is coming from, they may be Muslim that day or they may be Christian. This is the Wesleyan Church. And it's hard to see, but I want you to see above the door, it says McQuee Wesleyan Church. This is a new church that they're in the process of building. And this it's is one of the bigger. things that we're sponsoring. The building is made out of local... Outgrew their old church. Sorry. I said they're very glad that they outgrew their old church and they're happy to be building a new one. But the building is made out of mud bricks and you'll see more of that later. Amen. Now, they served us a meal. Oh, wait a minute. This is before that. This is sins. This one I wanted to make sure that it got in. If you notice, the children are on the back of, of their parents or an older sister or a grandmother, and all the women carry them that way with just a piece of cloth. They call it a lapa. I purchased one, one. We went to the market and got them. It's just probably three yards. They're all very bright and colored. Three yards by 54 inches. You take the top two corners, wrap it around the child, and then come under your arms, over your chest, and tie a knot. And then you take the bottom two corners, you tuck it under their butt, and then you tie it across your stomach. And that's, you see them carrying their children that way everywhere. No strollers, no car seats, because <laughs> there's no cars. There's, you know, that's all they have is a piece of cloth. 
Now this village was very excited about being sponsored. So they gave away a gift. Very expensive gift. And we were told by the district superintendent that you never refuse a gift from the village. And they gave us a goat. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, what are we going to do with a goat? <laughs> well, this is the goat going back to our hotel in the back of the pickup truck. And the rest of the story is the next night we had fresh goat for dinner. So in that, we brought gifts. They, we, they had made suggestions to things about things we can bring. So we brought pencils and stickers. And um, first I wanted to just hand out the stickers, but they wanted me to touch them and they wanted me to put the stickers on them. And that was really fun. There's a lot of motorcycles in Sierra Leone. And by the way, around here, usually you just see one person to a motorcycle. We saw as many as four people on motorcycles there. You just use them. But because there's a lot of motorcycles, there's a lot of old tires. So almost every village we went to, there were kids with a stick playing with the tires. Now, each of the villages we went into, World Hope sent ahead a meal for that day because they didn't want to impose on the villagers of having to come up with a meal. And that meal consisted of a huge thing of rice and some fish. And they would take the fish and make a stew out of it with some beans. And then they and would- And nuts to thicken it. And ladle that on top of the rice. And when the fish were served, I'm pretty sure they gutted them, but I think that's all they did. So there were bones and all kinds of exciting things to work your way through. And heads. <laughs> and this is how the villagers ate. You can see there would be a big platter. They just set it on the ground, and they just eat with their hands. They did recognize, and they gave us bowls with spoons but we were the only ones who had that, and all three villages we went to, we were seated up at the very front. I mean, it was very humbling to me because I felt like we were royalty to them. You know, we, we were these rich, rich Americans that were gonna come save them, and you want to, but you can't. That's why we have a lot of hands and feet, and you have a lot of people that are over there donating their time and their money and their lives to helping these people. And we talked about the bricks that they make. This is a man making bricks, and this is from earth that's dug about 20 feet from him. And you see that big field of bricks back there. Those are for his home. And once he gets enough of them made, then he'll start building his house. Yeah. And then they dry it? Yeah, they're digging it out over there. Oh, yeah. Huh. They also have to make the bricks in the dry season, which is when we were there, because in the rainy season, obviously, everything is muddy on its own and nothing will dry out. So this man was hoping to have his house built before the rainy season starts. He was saying crazy Americans want to see the bricks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was the end of that day. Now we're moving the next day to Mayintu. There's several spellings of this, and we decided that the highway department in Sierra Leone didn't even spell it right. So. right. Mayintu is the village that the Illinois district sponsors. Mm -hmm. It is impressive, and again, we are greeted. <laughs> This was most, a lot of Christians in the village, and, and they're always singing about Jesus, and it's all in Creole. It's because they do speak English, but it's Creole. So that it has some French, and it's very fast. And after a week, I could pick out one or two words when somebody was talking. Um, so we went to Mayantu, and World Hope International um, has a very cool way of doing this. 
Because the whole point is to make people buy into what we're doing to help them and know how to maintain it. And, um, but it's very simple things. There's a well. It's drilled down 132 feet um, so that it doesn't go dry in the rainy season. It's into the groundwater and it's clean water. Many of the villages have a well, but it's shallow, so it goes dry during the dry season. Or it's not clean, and people get ill from it. Um, another important thing that we have provided is a grain drying floor. So when we're driving along the, the dirt roads, people would have cloth on the ground and trying to dry their grain. So bugs and goats and chickens and ducks all walk through it and try to eat it and do their business in it. And a drying floor is concrete and it has a wall around it. And so it keeps the animals out and allows them to, to dry their grain and have safe things to eat. So there's two drying floors in Mayantu, so they're very rich. Watch here for the school children who are off to the side in Tony Pans. They're all lined up waiting for us. So, one of the important programs that um, World Hope International does is called WASH. You can't tell anybody about Jesus when they spend 18 hours a day trying to get enough food and enough water to survive. So it's water and sanitation, which is latrines, and health, which is teaching people to wash your hands and not put food on the ground so that people will be more healthy and be able to continue to farm and provide for their families. And this is actually mistitled. This is their, their existing church that was all really nice inside. But a building, a church building over there is usually maybe 20 by 40. And you'll usually put, oh, I don't know, 100, 150 people in there for church. Now, I, I want you to look at this and see that this is the school where they teach their children in my into. Yep. This, is, this is what they're using currently for school. That's what right? I heard, yeah. You can see this is an area of investment we need to think about. Mm -hmm. so Even something simple like blackboard. So one of the things that we're looking at helping them with next is building a school so they, they'll have some place that's decent to send the children and to educate them. They just sit on the, the ground. There were no stools, no chairs. It was a thatched roof. That so during the rainy season, holes. yeah, the during rainy season, thatched roof doesn't work very well. These are the teacher. The man in white is the pastor of that church, and then uh, the man in the yellow is um, the youth leader. And the lady, if I don't, you can't see it, but um, the children are very well behaved. And um, she doesn't have to use that switch very much. But it's there as a reminder. Is it there as a <laughs> reminder? And uh, the man in the vest is Joseph. He's one of World Hope's uh, liaisons to villages to um, help them continue to grow. None of these people have any income. Yeah, the, uh, these people well, Joseph are does, the teachers but... and the. Uh... The pastor, none of them receive any, any compensation for what they do. So we gave them some books and pencils, pencils and stickers and crayons mm -hmm. <clears throat> to the teachers so that they could distribute them. And candy. We hope we took enough. There were a lot of kids. Yeah. Oh, now this is after we had toured the village, then we all sat and had a meal together. And this is the, the children singing. I noticed the song leader. She used two water bottles with rocks in them. 
you have to remember they like to sing and that's because it's an oral society there's no written songs they're taught from one to another so he is my savior Most of you have heard about the pineapples. You want to take that, Michelle? Um, one of the things that's very important is a cash crop that allows them to buy grain to continue to farm and feed their family. So one of the things that World Hope has done through us is sponsor a pineapple farm. So they've all already had a couple harvests. They thought they were going to sell it to Dull. They found out that they did better if they sold it along the the road and so some of the hotels in neighboring towns and villages would come because they know the pineapples in Mayintu is are very sweet and very good. The ladies danced. We made a lot of new sisters dancing. And this was one of our little tiny song leaders. She came up and, and led a song for them. By the way, one of the interesting things was the chief of the village took an interest in my wife with her white hair, and he would <laughs> kept coming up to her and calling her sister all day long. <laughs> oh, Sin, you want to do the, the memory thing? Oh, while we were still at the first village we went to, we took soccer balls. I had told Tony I wanted to take soccer balls. He kind of thought, okay, whatever. He did his due diligence. We ordered them on Amazon. We had the pumps. We took them with us. At the first village we went to, he had them pumped up. So they saw them as we were carrying them in. And they were very excited when it came to the time that we were exchanging gifts and we presented the balls to the, the youth leader or the, or the pastor. And at Maya too, you saw all those little kids as they were dancing, and they would sit on those pews most of the time, quiet as little mice, very organized. And they were the youngest children, so that's why they were having school there. Some of the older children had to walk a couple of miles to another school. Um, this time, he had, Tony had them inflated, but he had them in a bag, like a gym bag. And when he started to bring those balls out, all those little boys jumped up, started yelling, started clapping. You would the thought- He was the superstar. Was, it was the best was cool. gift in the world. And then the older boys saw them, that they were coming in, and they challenged us to a soccer match. Now- Us old folks didn't do Yeah, that. us old folks. They're, the two pastors for Michigan were in their 30s. So one of them was a coach on one side, one was a coach on the other, and they ha here it is, 100 degrees. I would have been flat on my face, but they were running up and down in a field, and you would have thought they were great. And they, they immediately deflated one, because that was their backup, and they were going to save it. And it was just marvelous. It was a great, great experience. Petafu. I do. Okay. okay. So the third village, so we went to one village and they had been trying to get sponsored, but they had done some stuff themselves and very organized village, obviously strong village leadership. And then we went to Mayintu, was, which was like Scottsdale, okay, because we have sponsored them. And then we went to Petafu. That was the one that broke, I think, all of our hearts. Um, the saddest memory from that, actually, the little child in there, the little girl or boy, it was a boy in red, the mother turned to me when I was admiring her baby and said, you can have him. I can't take care of him. You can have him. Please take him. And the other villages, things were pretty orderly. You could tell that there was a hierarchy and that, you know, they had been told how to... to to behave. This village was very, very poor. And this was the kind of the, the greeting. This is the chaos. You 
can hear somebody in the background trying to get them to calm down. And of course, we can't understand any of this because we had an interpreter, so we're like, whoa, what's going on? Right, and so we um, had a meal, again, provided by World Hope International, and this is the one you could tell that people were very hungry. Um, and there was a hierarchy, but the men got ate first, and then the women, and then the children, if there was anything left. But so, when, they, when they served the food, they just, it was like flies just tearing at the food. And there was one young boy that I saw him sort of work his way into a bowl, and he came out with a fish, and he held it up like to show me with a big grin on his face and said, look what I got. And they had warned us ahead of time that it might be a little spicy, so I mainly had rice with a little bit of sauce. I was not brave enough to take any fish. I was. Um, <laughs> and I ate it and it was okay. And that was a, and then the next day at the second village, we had the same thing. And there I ate more rice with less sauce and no fish. And when they brought it out, when we were at this third village, they set it in the table in front of us and I thought, this is awful. I can't eat, th I don't think I can eat this again. And then they took the bowl away and set it on the ground. And, and we were it, grateful. It was, it was like flies going after this. And it was so humbling because this is probably the best meal that these people had in a week. And we were grateful not to eat it. Yeah. yeah. We were grateful not to eat it because it had been two days of fish and rice and very spicy. This is the soccer balls in, in this village. same. Now this is a panoramic view of the village. I just turned 360 degrees so you can see the kind of housing and there's all kinds. You know these are mud huts with thatched roofs. That's a tin roof down there. Now there's a mansion being built right there and we never could figure out who owned it. Somebody, we, someone has told me that it was somebody who worked in Freetown who is building for his family. And this town has a well, but it's dry because it's a shallow well this time of year. The children did get the um, sweet drinks because the World Hope people wouldn't let the adults take them. So they got, they got Coke and Fanta and um, sweet tea, and, and for some of them who didn't get to that bowl of rice, that's what they had for the day. Now we'd like to give you a sense for what it was like traveling in Sierra Leone. Uh, we were usually, I spent most of my time in the back of a Range Rover that had air conditioning, but none of it made it to the back of it. So we had the, the windows open in the back, and their bench seats on the sides, you usually had about six people in back. And this is a super highway. And the reason this is such a nice road is we were on our way to the Kamakui Hospital, and the president of Sierra Leone lived in this village before he was elected. So because of that, they built a very nice road from Freetown to his home. We got lots of African massages, and that means as you're going down the road, if your driver didn't see the pothole, you got bumped around. Now this is real interesting. You see this big dip in the road here. This is the dry season, so because of that, there's no big deal. We just drive through there. Our driver was telling us that in the rainy season, that would be up to the midpoint of the doors on the cars. 
and a lot of the vehicles we were in had a actually had snorkels on them up above the roof so they could get in three or four feet of water and keep running. One other real unusual thing was as we were driving down the road, occasionally you would come across a rope pulled across the road with little pieces of cloth. And they were checkpoints left over from part of the war, but they would check people going through. Now, since we were with World Hope, they would look at our, the door on the car and know that we were okay, and they would lower the rope. But this is what it would look like. You can see the rope stretched across there. And it would be tied on one side of the road, and on the other side of the road, there'd be a chair there. And the guy would loosen up the rope and drop it, and you'd drive over it and then you could keep going on your way. And this is McKinney, which is where we spent most of our time, and this was in downtown McKinney. A double for you. <laughs> so you made him a shirt, we went back the next day. There. At a time. All the umbrellas you see are individual little shops that they were always trying to sell you something, or they'd walk up to the vehicles and they'd have bananas or some sort of bread or pastry that and they all carry everything on their heads trying to sell it to you. Now this is Sin buying some fabric in the market in McQuee. Buying her lapa. Oh, her lapa. And <laughs> this video is not very good, but I want you to see the selection of shoes there. Oh yes, this was the entrance to the shopping mall. You, off the main street, there was this little dirt path that went back, and you went back about 20 feet, and there were stalls on both sides, and the path down the middle was probably three feet wide. And Sierra Leone is like that, like Freetown. There's a paved road, and then there's just dirt, and there's houses. And those are all the side roads. Those are all the little villages, the little communities. We stopped at a cemetery that had some of the first missionary graves that were Wesleyans that, that were there. And I like the sayings on the headstones. She hath done what she could. She gave all for others. And then here's a little one, five years, four months old. And when you think what these people did back then, it's just amazing. This was the Bible college that we went to that is sponsored by the Wesleyan Church. And it's not what we would consider a typical classroom. They did have chairs. Um, they did have a blackboard. This was the library that the, the gal, we she did have a librarian and she was, worked very, very hard at trying to organize it. There are a lot of books that were in English. So they are teaching them how to read and write English. So here's the best hospital in northern Sierra Leone, actually in all of West Africa. That was the patient triage and patient. We came in the afternoon. If we had come in the morning, this would have been packed full of people. This is the coolest thing. It's a clinic in a can. It has solar, its own yeah. water. Uh, this one is set up for maternity, so it has an ultrasound, though they do use ultrasound for a lot of things that you would use an x-ray for because they don't have the film. That is the lab, and it's sort of dark, but you can't see. The only thing in it is a microscope. One guy with a microscope, that's the lab for the entire hospital. Um, that's the major operating room, so it's really high tech. It has glass black windows that doesn't let the bugs in. And that is, a pay actually, that's the refeeding ward. Um, that is. They bring children five and under who are malnourished to the point of death and institute a refeeding. And that is the picture of all the little kids that they've saved. That is the uh, first Ebola isolation unit. The thing about Ebola is, is it's transmitted by bodily fluids. And what we learned about Ebola is, is when a person dies of Ebola, basically all the fluid in your body comes out through your skin. 
And part of their culture is before they bury someone is washing the bodies. And the, the virus was getting transmitted by the people washing the bodies of their dead and they had to teach them how to do that differently. They taught them how to use personal protective equipment, all the gowns, masks, gloves that we take for granted. Um, the building in the back is actually, was started during the Ebola crisis and um, it is ready for the next time. And they did have some solar power, which I found very interesting at the hospital. They couldn't use it very much because they, their batteries weren't good. So you have to be able to store the energy. So they could use it during the day, but they couldn't store much for night. And this is after about six hours in the car. Now this is, we went to church on Sunday, and this was totally amazing to me. You guys should be really thankful that we only, Absolutely. We only take one offering, okay? <laughs> we had been warned that there might be as many as three offerings, so don't put all your money in the, the first plate. Well, they must have known the rich Americans were there because in our church, they took five offerings. Um, now you have to remember that the 10,000 Leon is worth a dollar and a quarter. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to shoot any video in the church out of respect, but I did turn my phone on and recorded what some hymn singing sounds like. <laughs> I want you to imagine that you're in a room 20 by 40 with 150 people in there with that and you're cheek like cheek. three yeah. inches away from the music and yeah. it was amazing. So a that's lot of drums, they made a, like a xylophone out of wood. They had what you would think would be bells, but it was just, what was it, Tony? That well, they had a, they, they took a piece of all thread about a uh, half inch all thread, bent it into a U, and, just, and then they had a valve from an engine, a big long valve, and he, they were using that as the striker for the, uh, the symbol. Triangle. Yeah. They loved their music, and it was like a call to worship because the guys started playing, there was nobody in the church, and by the time, you know, 15 minutes went by, the church was packed. It's very interesting that it was mainly women and children, and they come out decked just right for church because they had their Sunday best on, all very bright and colorful. We got pictures, but we were trying to limit. But very, as you can see from the cloth I bought, you know, brilliant colors, and they all looked wonderful. So we left there and flew back to Belgium, and we had a six-hour layover in Belgium, so we decided we wouldn't wait in the airport. So we took a train to downtown Belgium, and we had a Belgium waffle in Brussels, Belgium. <laughs> and we returned to Chicago <laughs> to create, be cr welcome to buy this. I'm gonna let each person go through, and what did you learn? Well, first I have to talk about our hosts, um, Carrie Jo and Jeff. Carrie Jo is a missionary kid, grew up in Sierra Leone. She came back at a height of Ebola when she took the plane from Brussels to Sierra Leone. Her and another nurse were the only people on the plane. You talk about reaching people for Christ, when Ebola started, all the Muslim doctors left. The only people that stayed were the Christians. If you don't think they don't understand that, you're wrong. Carrie Jo is amazing doing much with nothing to little. One of, the thing, one of the things that happened there was she was telling us, you know, it's pretty easy to get equipment. In other words, if they tell people, hey, we need an ambulance, 
Within six months, somebody will volunteer and give them an ambulance. But nobody will give them money to maintain it. And she was talking about one of their ambulances. Well, we can't drive it when it rains because the tires are bald. It almost got stuck in a river the night before on a call. And here we are, blessed beyond measure. There are 10 of us here in, in the room. And everyone pulled out their wallets. They needed $850. And we had 600 and the church in Rockford came up with the other 400. So now they will have tires and they will be able to fix the headlights and they will be able to do that. But this, this Carrie Jo is the one who got this started and it's for maternity and now they're, because there are three whole ambulances in Northern Sierra Leone, they're all, um, and they, op they operate 24 hours a day, they have drivers. They are able to open that up to under five, which means, again, the children that are so malnourished to the point of death that they can bring them into the hospital to save their lives. She's doing something remarkable with calling, calling, helping babies breathe. You know those little two buck nasal um, ball, syringe bulbs you get when you have a baby? Blue. Blue, blue yeah. Blue. The little blue bulbs. Helping babies breathe, she has gotten, I don't know how many, you know, what does that cost? 15 cents, probably wholesale. We pay two bucks for it at Target. It has made such a difference because she went and ta taught all the uh, birth attendants and the midwives how to use a bulb suction and was able to gather an embu bag. That's the breathing um, thing that you press when kids aren't breathing. And so that babies are living because she was able to provide that. The other thing you need to know about is that um, she, doesn't, she doesn't have her license in Sierra Leone. But that's because she's doing so many other things. She's organizing helping babies breathe. She's organizing the ambulance service. She ne needs help organizing Kamakui Hospital. They just got a, a big donation of equipment. But the people that are there don't know what most of it is, and they need people to just organize. They're gonna get a big donation from MAP, I can't remember the name of the, the, but it's a pharmaceutical thing. They're gonna need people to sort through the drugs. So guys, I'm going back. <laughs> Not this year. Because she is doing so much with so little. And she just keeps moving forward day at a time. She's blessed because Jeff came to join her and they've been there two and a half years. And uh, he has a vision because they just moved three weeks ago. So she, they moved three weeks ago and he had two sets of, of uh, teams through already. He hosted dinner for us two different evenings. Right. And it's on a complex that used to be what, Tony? It was like a training center. It was devastated during the war and I think it was Wesleyan. Um, and they just started rehabbing it. So the district superintendent and Carrie Jo and Jeff and their daughter Rebecca live there in two different buildings. Their vision is tremendous.